Hey everybody, it's uh, Pastor Reggie Sanchez from Gospel Community Church here on April 25th to uh, continue our series on the issue uh, of abuse. This is part three uh, of our series on the issue of abuse. And in this particular uh, message, we're going to examine how abusers get enabled and strengthened in the church. And so last time I, we did a message on the tactics of abusers. What are all their schemes and games and tools that they use to perpetuate their abuse, to uh, create a system of enablers and to keep themselves ultimately from having any real accountability and any real consequences. We talked about that last time. We saw how abusers will use uh, extreme physical abuse to keep people under their control. They will then use threats of repeating that abuse or doing or, or extending that abuse to a loved one if the person under their control doesn't comply with their wishes. We also talked about how the abuser will use flattery and bribes and try to addict people to his or her praises or money or uh, any other uh, types of possession or thing that, that a person wants, he, the abuser will supply the want in exchange for you doing what they uh, want you to do. Uh, we also saw that every abuser, every manipulator, every single one of them, they are all liars and lies are a very profound tool in the abuser's toolbox. They uh, spin things and twist things and lie with the truth and alter facts and, and, and uh, or they will entirely m make things up that never even happened or they will just flatly deny things that did happen. But lies is always a significant part of how the abuser operates. And then we also saw that the abuser loves to blame shift. As soon as the blame comes to him or comes to her, she will do whatever he or she will do whatever they can to shift the blame onto someone else. Hopefully in their mind, they can shift it all to someone else or something else. But if they can't shift all of it uh, off of themselves, then they want to at least shift part of it to someone else. And so through this blame shifting and relabeling situations, the abuser and the manipulator makes himself or herself a victim. And that is critical to their schemes. They got to be a victim of something, some circumstance, some hard trial in life, some mistreatment by someone else, because when they are a victim, then it is that becomes the, the, their victimization becomes the excuse that they need to continue in their sin and continue in their abusive ways. So we, we ended last time with saying that an abuser and those who enable them, what they do is they relabel situations to where good things or good people are branded as evil and evil things and evil people are labeled as good. And when that happens, Proverbs 17, 15 says an abomination is committed in God's eyes. And the abomination is this, the righteous are condemned and the wicked are acquitted. So the, the, the people in sin, the, the, the ones enabling sin, the ones who really need to be held accountable, the ones who really need to repent, who really need to change, they get enabled. And the ones who see through the games and who the abuse victim who speaks up or the person who sees through the manipulator's ways and stand up and holds them accountable, they become the evil ones. It's Satan's subtle, crafty way of relabeling situations to commit an abomination. So that was last time. This time what we're going to do is we're going to take some time to meditate on how this takes place in the church. Because this absolutely takes place in the church. In fact, it's my opinion that it is an absolute epidemic that wicked people and abusers and manipulators are constantly enabled by the church of Jesus Christ under the name of grace, love, and the gospel. And so today, what I'm hoping to do is, for first for the abuse victim, I want to give you some hope that if you've been in churches before that have enabled your abusers and won't hold them accountable, I want to give you hope that, you know what, there are some believers and there are some churches who do see through these things and who will not enable abusers. And if you have been an enabler, my hope is maybe God will use in some measure to open up your eyes and help you 
to truly be equipped in your thinking and your understanding of the word to stop doing that. And then lastly, my hope is that perhaps an abuser uh, himself or herself will come to salvation. So uh, that's what we're going to tackle today. Um, uh, we're going to explore the twisting of scripture to enable abuse victims. So let's start with why do abusers and manipulators get enabled in the church in the name of Jesus and the name of the love of God and the gospel? Well, I think the first reason, uh, it's pretty simple that I want to start with is number one is many people in the church, you know, maybe they have a sweetheart. They love God. They're not trying to be evil. They're not trying to be an enabler. They're just naive. And, you know, they, they, they want to believe the best for people. They want to be kind to people. All those things are good, godly things, but the abuser will find that and recognize it and exploit it. And if you lack discernment, then you're going to be an enabler, even if your intention is very loving. I want to read an extremely important passage about how we're to carry ourselves in the church. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Paul says, it's my prayer that your love will abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you can approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So if you're going to truly be a loving person, which all of us as believers want to be, then Paul says our love needs to abound with knowledge and discernment so that we can approve what's excellent. But when we're loving people and our love lacks knowledge, our love lacks biblical discernment, then what happens is unintentionally, we don't approve what's excellent. We start approving what's wicked, even though that is, would never be our attention, our intention, excuse me. So I want to just plead with you. It is critical that your love have knowledge and discernment so you don't unintentionally enable the wicked. So the first reason why abusers and manipulators get enabled in the church is simply because the church lacks knowledge and it lacks discernment about how to properly love. There's the right heart and the good heart to love uh, the abuser. That's a good thing, but it's just lacks knowledge and discernment. And so uh, I, I also think that just a lot of, a lot of people find it hard to believe that someone they know who maybe has good theology could possibly be an abuser. And so there's just this naivety to it. But I want to read to you a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. This is talking about people in the church. And this is not a doctrinal issue. They're not denying the gospel. These are just evil people who have good theology. Let's read. Paul says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, now look, look at the next word, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Ouch. That's a pretty bad list. Now, this list here is characteristic. There are people like this. And so if you saw someone in your church who was acting like this, but maybe there's one thing on this list that they weren't doing, that doesn't mean they're not this type of person. This is a representative list of a lifestyle of people. It doesn't mean for someone to rightly be classified as someone in this list. It doesn't mean they have to be guilty of every single word that's put in here, but they are just fundamentally, characteristically, they operate in a substantial manner that's similar to what's described in this pattern or in this passage. So I just read all these terrible things about the people being described in 2 Timothy 3. Well, how do I know that these people are in the church? Because I said that this is going to describe in the church. Where am I getting that from? From the text. Well, if you look at the next verse, which is verse 5, it says that these types of people are those who uh, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. So these are people who have an appearance of godliness, but they, they deny the power, meaning they don't actually know the Lord. They don't actually have the power through a saving faith. They don't have the power to live in a godly way. They're in bondage to these characteristic sins, but they have an appearance of godliness. 
they have their maybe they have the right theology. They go to a good church. They go to a church that's faithful, that it's led by good leaders and stuff like this. So uh, maybe they're really diligent to you know be a Bible study or whatever. And they man, they look like they're godly, but they're not. These are people in the church. And one of the words I read off of this list is that people. They are people who are abusive. Let's keep reading. Paul says at the end of verse 5, to avoid such people. I wonder if that squares with your view of love. Verse 6, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. So they're going to prey on vulnerable women. Maybe it's vulnerable children. Maybe it's vulnerable men. Maybe it's disabled. They're going to prey on weak people. There's a lot of people that do that. Now, these again, these are people who are in the church. How do I know it? Look at verse 7. They are always learning, but never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So they're always learning things. They're always learning the Bible. These types of people, they can be obsessed with their Bibles. They can be obsessed with theological things, things that are in the Bible. But I've found these types of people who I've known, they're usually really obsessed with bizarre things like... Uh, it, Crazy, bizarre end times theories or aliens or crazy stuff. Like, oh, uh, who was this random person in this passage? There's some obscure thing. They're constantly obsessing over things that aren't even going to help you in the faith. And so they're always learning. They're always talking about biblical things, but they're never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, this, this a knowledge of the truth of Christ in a way that delivers them from this type of life. They're just wrecked and rotted with sin from the inside out, but they're always talk, 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 talk about the Bible. There's always this appearance of godliness, but they, they are, their life denies the reality and the saving power of these things. Let's keep going. Verse 8. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. So there's this uh, episode where Moses is being opposed. Now, that when these guys are opposing him, they're not saying, hey, Yahweh doesn't exist. That's not the opposition. They hate leadership. They hate authority. They want to take the authority themselves. And that's what these men are like. When there's real godly authority in their life who will hold them accountable for the deceitful schemes they're walking in, and they oppose them. And Paul has to tell us here at the end that these men are corrupted in mind. Their mind's so twisted. It's They have a bunch of Bible data in it. They have a bunch of Christian things in their mind, but their mind's so corrupted and twisted. They use everything inside of them to stay in this kind of sin. And these people, we know they're in the church because they have the appearance of godliness and they're always learning. They're learning about th things of the Bible. And then Paul has to spell out in verse 8 that these men are disqualified regarding the faith. Well, if this was an atheist, then Timothy isn't going to need Paul to explain, hey, he's, they're disqualified from the faith. Of course, they're not even professing the faith. These are people who profess the faith. They're in the church. They are abusive. They're characterized by all these other sins. They prey on the weak. Uh, they, they're lovers of iniquity in every single way. They're always learning the Bible. They're always looking religious. They're always committed to Christian things, but they are disqualified concerning the faith. And verse 5 commands us in the church to avoid these people. Now, how does that square, I would ask you, with your view of the love of Christ, with your view of grace, with your view of forgiveness, with your view of the gospel? Do you have a view of those things that can take passages like this from the scripture and say, I know how to discern these kinds of people and I will obey the command to avoid them? Because there's a, the only commandment in this text is verse 5. It says, avoid these people. Now, in order for us to to obey that commandment, we have to discern who those people are. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've heard in churches where I've heard people say, well, we can't know people's hearts. Only God knows people's hearts. We couldn't possibly know who those people are. And so it takes this theology that man can't know the heart of someone else and, and only God knows the hearts in the ultimate sense, which there's truth to that. But then when we apply it, it's 
we can't ever know who these people are. So though those are all fine sounding theological statements, but unfortunately it destroys the church's ability to discern who second Timothy three people are. And it destroys the church's ability to obey the commandment of verse five, to avoid those types of people. So we have to be careful that we're not, we don't take true true things about the Bible and then apply them in a way that destroys clear texts that give us commandments. If we're doing that, then our theology is wrong, or at least our application of our theology is wrong. So people are just, I, I think, why do these abusers get enabled? Number one, as we try to love in the church, we just don't have the knowledge and discernment we ought to have. And then number two, I just think we're naive. Uh, a lot of us are just naive that someone with good theology could actually be this way. And it's, uh, so I think that's reason number one. Uh, another reason why abusers get enabled is because many Christians, uh, they love the abuser. And a lot of times the abuse victim even loves the abuser. The abused spouse loves her husband or his wife. The abused child loves his parent or the abused pastor loves the person in his church or the abused church member loves his pastor or whatever, whatever the situation is. The teacher loves the student, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the scenario is, the abuse victim loves the abuser. And you know what? That's a good thing. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of Matthew, you can read that sermon in Matthew chapter five through seven. He told us to love our enemies. It's a good thing to love our enemies. Listen, it's it's part of the power and glory of God through the church that the church loves the church's enemies and the church labor for the conversion of, of our enemies, of those who mistreat us. That's part of the glory of God. That's a good thing. That's a godly thing. But what we need to understand, what I believe most of us need to grow in is knowledge and discernment about how to love our enemies. The way we love our enemies, especially in the church, I'm not talking about communist, atheist persecutors outside the church. Those guys don't even profess faith. I'm not, it will look differently for a professing unbeliever than it will for a professing believer who's really our enemy inside the church. That those, those are two different situations. How do we rightly love abusers in the church? We have to know how to do that. Those who profess Christ, those who walk in unrepentant sin and are manipulators, we as Christians have got to have the right knowledge and discernment about how to love them. And so here's some things that I've heard. I'm sure you've heard these things before. I want to stay, give you some true theological statements, but tell you how it's misapplied and enables abusers and manipulators. So Let's say you've got an abuser and a manipulator in substantial sin. We're not talking about petty things here and there. The you know, First uh, Peter four, First uh, Peter four verse eight tells us there is a place where man love covers a multitude of sins. We don't have to go around and slap each other on the wrist over every little teeny sin committed, and I got to hold you accountable. You you know you r r raise your voice slightly. Three months ago to your kid, it, you know, at a, at a car accident or something, I mean, it, whatever. There's a place where, look, there's these minor sins that get committed that we just overlook it. We just forbear. We're just patient. We're just gracious. But there comes a point in someone's life where their sin is so corrosive to their walk. It's becoming part of who they are or it's so big and, and, and disturbing them. And we got to hold these things accountable. But here's some things that I've heard in pretty much every church I've ever been a part of, and I'm sure you've heard them as well, you, you know, someone will be in significant sin and we'll talk about dealing with that or we try to address that sin in the person's life and then the abuser or the manipulator becomes really hard. Oh, how dare you say that to me? Look, hey, yeah, I committed this sin, you know, that's true, but you have sinned too. See, the Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. James says that if we sin in one part of the law, we're guilty of transgressing the whole thing. See, everybody's sinful. How come we only want to address some kinds of sins, but not other kinds of sins? And so, is it true that everyone has sinned? Yes. Is it true that James says this before God, if we've transgressed one little teeny part of the law, we're guilty of, we're guilty of all of it? Yes, that, that's true. Is it true that sometimes churches can be partial or Christians can be partial, meaning we'll only confront certain types of sins but not others? Is that true? Yes. But look, when I'm in sin and I want to take all of those things 
and string them all together. And then my application of those truths is get off my back. I'm not going to be accountable. I don't need to repent. Stop trying to hold me accountable. What have I just done with the truth? I have just manipulated it in such a way that I'm using the truth to advance my own unrepentance. God hates that. That's not love. That's called deceitful schemes. So here's, here's some other things. It's like, hey, man, I'm, you know, I'm really concerned. So-and-so is just you know, in significant sin, they won't stop getting drunk or whatever the issue is. And then the person, you know, who also knows about it says, oh, well, hey, man, uh, Christ came to save sinners. He didn't come from the healthy. He came for the sick. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for the unrighteous. He came to save the sinner and the, and the vile person. He didn't come for the righteous person. We got to understand that. Okay, is that true? Did Christ come for sinners? Of course it's true. Did he come for the sick and not the healthy? Of course it's true. But we can't take that truth and apply it in such a way that when professing Christians are unwilling to repent, we just say, ah, you know what? You don't need to repent because Christ came for sinners. That is not in any way, shape, or form how God intends for that truth to be applied. And so the reason these kinds of strongholds last in the church is because they're theologically true. It's just the error comes in the application. And so we have to think these things through. And so here's, here's some other ones. It's like, hey, man, I'm really worried that, you know, that I, I see this young lady or this young man, they're, they're in this dating relationship, and this person, man, it just doesn't love God. And look how the person has changed since this new relationship's come in their life. Man, they don't love the Lord. They're not in the Word anymore. They're, they're all about the world. They're, they're, they're totally different. You say, oh, and then here's, here's the response. Ah, hey, Jesus came and hung out with sinners. He's with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the drunkards. He came for sinners. He's not with the righteous people. He's not with the pastors. He's not with the church people. He's with the sinners. Okay, is it true that Jesus came to interact with sinners? Yes. Is it true that Jesus was with tax collectors and prostitutes and, and went and ate with these people? Yes. But for what purpose? To save them and turn them and make them new and bring them out of that life. Not so that he can, they can continue to stay in that life. And as long as Jesus is over for dinner, let me stay in my sins. So look, the, the person who's in this bad relationship that's being destroyed spiritually, 2 Second, Second Corinthians 6 says we, could be un, we can unequally yoke ourselves to people. That people that will lead us away from the living God, away from the obedience of faith. And we need to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. And so we need to get rid of those relationships if they are rotting us spiritually, not say, hey, Jesus was with sinners, so let me build my entire friend network around people who don't have a heart for God, who are gonna now corrupt me and lead me away from the Lord, and I'm gonna justify it all biblically by saying Jesus hung out with sinners. That's not the right application of that. The right application would be, yeah, we go meet sinners where they're at and love them in, in, in humility and grace for the purpose of them coming to faith and coming out of their sins. Not for the purpose of us justifying, you know, hanging out at the bar all the time now. That's a, those are all wrong applications. And all of these types of things, they get done in the name of love. Here's the last one, the last lie I want to expose. Uh, someone will be confronted in their sin. Hey, man, you you can't keep looking at pornography, man. This is sin. This is lust. This is adultery of the heart. Like, why do you, why do you keep doing this? And it's like, hey, 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 don't you know I'm saved by grace through faith? I'm not saved by my works. See, Paul said that in Romans 3. Paul said that in Romans 4. Said it in Ephesians 2. I'm not saved by my works. Why are you pointing out my sins and trying to get me to turn from myself? I'm not saved by my works. This isn't legalism here. I'm saved by grace through faith, and it's about a relationship with God. Is that true? Is it true that we're saved by grace through faith? Of course it's true. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you're saved through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. Of course it's true. Is it about us having a relationship with God? Of course it is. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. But am I to take the truth that I'm saved by grace through faith and I have a relationship with God. I'm going to take those truths now and apply them in a way that makes light of sin and I don't need to repent. Of course not. Of course not. And so 
I'm going to go through a ton of scriptures here um, to show us Hopefully what the real mission of the church is, what real the real love of God is, and the real love of the church is. And again, I want to encourage you, write these passages down. Meditate on these passages. Memorize them. I'm going to go through them quickly, but take your time through this video and get these scriptures into your heart and into your mind that you might be equipped uh, to be right. So let's think now, if we're going to love with all knowledge and discernment, let's think about... What is the church's calling? What is the church's mission? What is the love of God? What is the love of the church? What are we called to do and be towards unbelievers and those in the church? What's the goal? Let's ask that question. So let's remember, uh, brethren, the mission of the church in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said, go therefore to all nations and make disciples teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. That's the mission. Teaching through the proclamation of the gospel and salvation by grace through faith in Christ who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and rose on the third day that we receive only by faith. Through that gospel-centered mission, we are called to labor to make obedient disciples who obey in everything. That's the mission. It's not get people to pray and ask Jesus to come into their heart and then pretend to be Christian while they attend this event called church and carry this piece of literature called the Bible and have appearance of godliness but deny the power. That is not the mission. The mission is labor to make obedient disciples. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 49, Jesus told the disciples that repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name. Listen, we receive Christ by faith, and we receive him by faith. We repent and turn from our life of sin. And if you do not repent and turn from your life of sin, you are not a Christian. That's the mission, according to Luke 24. Colossians 1.28, what did Paul say is the goal of his apostleship? He says it's to present every man mature and complete in Christ. He didn't say it's to get as many people as possible to pray and ask Jesus to come into their heart and then tell them, okay, now everything's fine. Go live up however you want because the grace of God will just cover all that. That is not the mission. That's an American mission. That's a... That's a worldly mission. That's a mission that might build big churches and create huge buildings and get lots of numbers and lots of money and lots of fame. People will give you millions of dollars to tell them if they do this magic act called asking Jesus to come into their heart, they won't go to hell while they continue to live in sin. They will give you millions of dollars to tell them that, but it's a lie. Romans 1.5, Romans 16.26 26, Paul states the purpose of his apostleship is to bring about what? The obedience of faith among all the nations. That's what the purpose of his apostleship is. He says that in Romans. He begins and ends the book of Romans by saying that. And the book of Romans is the greatest presentation of the gospel in all the scriptures. The gospel of salvation by faith in Christ alone. And yet Paul says to begin it and to end it. The goal of it all is the obedience of faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Paul says, Godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation. There's a link there. I have godly sorrow. I'm going to bring it to the cross. I'm going to trust in Christ. I hate the way my sin makes me feel. And so that godly sorrow is going to lead me to repent. I'm going to turn from it. And A lifestyle of repentance, that scripture says, is unto salvation. Meaning, no repentance, no salvation. Jesus, in John chapter 14, verse 21. I, I remember one time, a long time ago at a, a work event, I had a guy who was, he drank about 18 beers, and uh, he was going off to me about how much he loves Jesus. And I confronted him about his drunkenness. And he said his drunkenness doesn't matter, and I showed him from the scriptures like Galatians 5, uh, where no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God and how 1 Corinthians 5 show, tells me that if someone professes to be a believer and won't repent of drunkenness, I'm commanded not even to eat with them. And so I asked him, I was like, you say you love Jesus. Why are you disobeying his commandments? And he told me, I don't need to obey his commandments because I'm saved by faith. 
And I showed him John 14, 21. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. It doesn't say if you love me, you take a Facebook meme and type amen and share and like, and then that's how you're going to be saved. Or you get, It doesn't say that. If you love me, Jesus says, the way Jesus is going to evaluate if you love him or not is not by your sentiments, not by your feelings, not by your words. Do you obey his commandments as your Lord and Savior? If you do not walk in obedience to Jesus, you do not love Jesus. Those are, that's not my opinion. Those are his words, John 14, 21. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, Paul says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. So Paul talks about saving grace in Titus 2, 11. And as you continue to read the passage, please go look it up. As you continue to read the passage, as he works through verse 14, he's talking about saving grace the entire time. It appears and brings salvation. And he says the same grace that brings salvation is a grace that trains those who have truly been saved to renounce ungodliness. That means it trains us. If grace is really operative in you, if you've really been saved by grace, then God's grace in you will train you to turn from sin and renounce ungodliness. And Paul also says in that passage, it will teach you to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age as you are zealous to devote yourself to good works. If the grace of God has not done that to you, then it hasn't saved you. It isn't legalism to say a Christian saved by grace needs to walk by faith. Legalism is, the real definition of legalism is through my obedience, I'm going to achieve my own salvation. Through my righteousness, through my own rituals, through my own whatever, I'm going to contribute to my salvation or achieve my salvation. That's legalism. The gospel is you can't do anything to save yourself. You believe Christ died for you and rose from the dead. God saves you and you receive it by faith alone. And he gives it to you as a gift. But in saving you, he changes you, makes you a new creature, puts his spirit within you, and now enables you to live in the obedience of faith as you turn from your sin. And because he's made you a new creation, because he's put life in you, you will turn from your sin. You will hate sin. You will fight sin. You will walk in a lifestyle of obedience, walk in a lifestyle of repentance. No, you won't be perfect in this life, but you will be real. And all of us know there's all the difference in the world between the fake game playing liar who leans on the grace of God as an excuse for sin and the real Christian who knows he's saved by grace, who is legitimately struggling with sin and fighting. But they're real, man. They are making war. They're, they're, they're for real. They're the real deal. Those are two separate things. And so the abuser gets enabled if we think the first type of person, the one who just has a good theology about the gospel who lives in sin. If we think that person's a Christian and we won't hold them accountable to repent, we're going to enable them. And that's what abusers depend on. Uh, so lastly, last couple of things here. Grace does not lead us to continue in sin. Paul says this in Romans 6, verse 15 through 17. The grace of God, man, we put to death sin when we're saved by grace. Paul says in Romans 3, 8, that the one who says, well, hey, let my sin abound so God's grace can, can abound, that person deserves condemnation according to Romans 3, 8. James and James chapter 2, verses 14 through 19, he says there's a faith of demons. You can believe, look, the, de the devils believe there's one God. The devil believes Jesus is the son of God. I mean, you can see it in Matthew 8, I believe. Jesus drives out the demons and the demons are terrified. They're like, whoa, they call him the son of God. They believe he's going to torture them on the appointed day in hell, which is all true. They, they, they know all these things. They have faith. But it's not saving faith. It's a dead faith. And similarly, people can have faith in Jesus, that he's the son of God, that he died for our sins, that he rose from the dead, and your faith can be 100% false. It can be the, a dead faith that is demonic, and it cannot save you. If your faith leads you to have nothing to do with the body of Christ, leads you to be at peace with your sin, leads you to indulge your sin, leads you to not pursue obedience and the love of God, your faith is false. Look, I'm not trying to be mean to you, but I'm trying to labor for your salvation. If you're listening to this and that's you, you need to be saved. I would love to help you with that and love you and minister to you, but minister to you in truth. 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, there are going to be many people at the day of judgment who come up to him in the name of Jesus. Say, hey, man, didn't we do all sorts of things in your name? They're going to appear, appeal to dead religious hypocritical works as to why they should be saved. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, meaning you're those who gave yourself over to sin. I never knew you. That's a reality. That's going to happen someday. And I have no doubt some of you listening to this, that's where you're at right now. And I want to plead with you to repent and come to Christ for real. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, Jesus calls the Laodicean church lukewarm. And he says he's about to vomit them out of his mouth. And the reason for it isn't because they've denied the gospel of justification by faith alone. It's because they have become, they, they've fallen in love with the world, with riches. We are rich and well-fed. We we're in need of nothing. They become self-sufficient. They, they, they rely on their goods and, and, and those types of things. This isn't a theological blasting. They've become rotted in sin. And so he says, he tells them in this passage, the love, the loving Jesus Christ, in his love in this passage, he tells them to their face, you are poor, pitiful, blind, and naked, and I'm about to puke you out my mouth. That is the loving Christ who says that. Listen, love's not always what we think it is. It's not always teddy bears and flowers. Yes, gentleness and kindness and sweetness. Man, that's the rhythm and fabric and heartbeat of the Christian life. But there is a place, make no doubt about it. It is everywhere in the scriptures where when we are faced with stubborn, hardened, unrepentant, manipulative game players, we have to look them in the eye and say, you are poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. That's the love of God. Jesus says these things in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 18. Please go read it. It's in the text. And then, remarkably, in Revelation 3, 19, in the same context, Jesus tells this church, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Fascinating. Here you have a church hardened in sin, and Jesus has to expose them. They're blind. They're too comfortable. These little gentle proddings to the church, it isn't going to work with this church. They're hardened. And so Jesus tells them, you're poor, you're pitiful, you're blind, you're naked. I'm about to puke you out my mouth. He has to get sharp in that rebuke. Just like Paul commands in Titus 1 verses 10 through 16. Just like Paul threatens in 1 Corinthians 4 21, or that he says he doesn't want to have to be severe in his use of authority in 2 Corinthians 13. All of these things we see in scripture, Jesus does this here with these people who are just become so comfortable in their sin. They needed him to give them a sharp rebuke and he gave it. And when he gave it, Jesus becomes his own self-interpreter. And in Revelation 3, 19, he says it's his love. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. He does not say those whom I love, I look at them and I ask, hey, did you ask me to come into your heart? Okay, cool. Well, hey, you're living in unrepentant sin, but you know what? I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. Uh, where Everybody's a sinner. No sin's greater than any. He doesn't talk like that. That's not his love. Jesus knows what his love is. And he tells us under the inspiration of the spirit with Jesus speaking himself, my love to my church is I will rebuke and discipline you so that you will be earnest and repent. And sometimes that rebuke must be very sharp, so sharp that I will say to your face, you are poor, pitiful, blind and naked. I'm about to puke you out my mouth. That's the love of Jesus. And I'm telling, I'm pleading with you, Christian, you have to have a theology that accommodates that. That is not the only expression of the love of Christ. He's gentle and tender. And when he finds a repentant person like the adulteress in John 8, he don't talk like this to her. She's repentant. He says, man, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. I, I, I love you. You know, when Zacchaeus is not a game player, but he gets saved and he sells everything and he repents, Jesus says, man, salvation has come to this house. He celebrates. He's tender. He's loving. He's kind. But he knows when to handle his business. Because he has real biblical love, real biblical discernment. He doesn't operate with 21st century American love. We are the world. The only sin is telling someone they're wrong. He is not deceived by all of the heresies that float through the United States right now. And so <clears throat> it's important for us to know these things. The last thing. 
Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verse 26, to the Jews who are rejecting Christ, he says that the blessing God wants to give them, he says it's turning every one of you from your wickedness. Turn you from your wickedness is a blessing from God. That's how God wants to bless us, not enable us in our wickedness. And so we have to understand what the mission is. We have to understand what the love of Christ is. We have to understand what it is to love each other. Look, 1 John 5, 2. This is one, I, I forgot to mention this. 1 John 5, 2. John says, we know that we love the brothers. We love the church. When what? When we obey God's commandments. We love each other when we walk in obedience to God's commandments. And so the other way of loving, knowing the love of Christ means he will rebuke and discipline and plead for repentance, the person who's walking in sin, knowing from 1 John 5, 2, that love for the church means I myself am going to obey. Well, let's take those two things together. What if my brother is in sin? Then what do I do? How do I love him? You don't love him by watching him destroy himself in sin. You love him by going and laboring to turn him from his sin, not using true theological things to create satanic applications that enable him in sin and help him destroy himself unto eternal hell. That is not love. And yet, so many churches do this, especially to abusers. The abuser, believe me, the abuser is good. Most abusers are smart. They're in a position of strength. And they know how to read people. They know how to read churches. They know what the core values of churches are. They know what theological hobby horses a church has. They know what the gospel is. And they think about these things. And because they're corrupted in mind, like 2 Timothy 3 says, when they think about these things, they then take these truths to apply them in a way that makes them walk in sin and not be held accountable. That's what the abuser and the manipulator does. And so when someone is in sin, when someone will not repent, when someone's playing all these games, all the tactics I talked about in the last, uh, the last message that the abuser uses and all the false theological, uh, all the true theological statements with demonic applications, all that nonsense, what do we have to do as the church when we encounter this stuff? How do we love them? That's an important question. We need to love these people. We don't want to hate these people, but we need to love them rightly. The word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, tells us that we are to confront them about their sin and try and lead them to repentance. And if they won't repent, then we bring two or three. And if they won't repent, we bring it to the church. And if they won't repent, then we must discipline them out of the church until they repent. That's love. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, read that chapter, there's a man who is sleeping with his stepmother and the church is tolerating it. The church is doing nothing about it. And they're proud of themselves. They're proud that, man, we get the grace of God. We get the love of God. Look at us, man. They're not approving of this guy's sin, but they're just proud of how, quote, gracious they are, how loving they are, how much they get the gospel. They're proud of this. And when Paul looks at that situation, Paul's the one who taught the church the gospel. Paul tells him, why are you proud of this? You need to put this guy out of the congregation right now. And so the church became proud of their demonic application of grace, their demonic application of love, their demonic application of the gospel. They became proud of something they should be ashamed of. The relabeling occurred. Good was called evil and evil was called good. So Paul had to correct them and tell them, man, no, 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 no. Stop doing that. And Paul tells us in that passage that if someone says they're a Christian and they won't turn from unrepentant sin, man, we're not even to eat with them so that one day, so that they can be handed over to Satan, handed over to the world, get them out of the church, let them go with the world, let them be away from the church. And then what might happen? They might come to their senses like the prodigal son and repent and the result will be that their soul might be saved. That's how we love. Those are not fun ways to love people, but they're biblical ways to love people. It's how God commanded us to love those who profess Christ and won't turn from their sins. Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 talks about those who are in the church who are stirring up strife and division. Warn them once, warn them twice. After that, I have nothing to do with them. They're warped and sinful. I mean, these are, this is crazy stuff. 1 Timothy 1, uh, 
It's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Paul talks about these two guys named Hymenaeus and Alexander who are blaspheming. And Paul said he disciplined them out of the church so that they would repent. So if we're dealing with abusers and manipulators in the church and they won't repent, guys, we have to confront them to their face, call out their sin, and demand their repentance. And if they won't repent, we've got to hold them accountable, not enable them with demonic applications of the gospel and the love of God and the grace of God. And so here's, though, how tragically, far too often, here's how it goes in the church. You'll have these abusive manipulators in the church, and maybe the abuser speaks up, and the abuser wants them to be held accountable for their sins. And then maybe there's a couple of other people in the, in the church who they have discernment, they have knowledge, and they see through the games that the abuser is operating with, and they go hold the abuser accountable. Well, when the abuser can't win over his abuse victim and those holding him accountable and he knows it, the abuser then goes and through flattery and smooth speech and self-pity, all kinds of his tactics that we've already spilled out. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18 says, he deceives the hearts of the naive. The abuser goes and he can cry, oh man, they're being so mean to me and I just love the gospel and they keep telling me I got to repent and you know, all this stuff and they create whatever their sob story is. They will get, through the tears, they can pull on the heartstrings of well-intended Christians and then deceive these Christians into believing, oh, these people holding me accountable are so mean. And through demonic applications of what the grace of God and gospel of God is supposed to be, they get this now team of naive people. And listen, sometimes the naive people are pastors and the leaders in the church. And that's when it's at a really bad level. So they get their network of enablers through all kinds of methods, but especially through demonic applications of biblical truth. And once the abuser and the manipulator has his little team of the naive, the naive then gang up on the abuse victim and they gang up on the person holding them accountable. And when the, per the people holding them accountable, whether it's the abuse victim or just the people who see through what's going on or both, when they hold the line and they say, nope, there needs to be repentance here, then the naive, if they are the majority, here's some things that they do. They begin to alienate and shun or, 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 or persecute or shame the people who would hold someone accountable. They try to shame them into silence. And in extreme cases, they'll even discipline those people out, wrongly labeling them as divisive. Holding someone accountable is not being divisive. And so they will do this stuff. The team of the naive and the abuser they will silence the abuse victim. They will silence those holding them accountable through all sorts of different mechanisms. Man, you don't get the gospel. Where's your love? Where's your grace? Where's your forgiveness? You know, all this sort of stuff. It's like, hey, my love and grace is I'm trying to get this guy to walk in the holiness of God. Forgiveness? Yeah, this guy repents, man. Our forgiveness is fully extended. That's what Matthew 18 says. But... Because you don't agree with their demonic applications of love and grace, you now become the bad guy, whether you're the abuse victim, the person holding them accountable, or both. And it's really a tragic thing when this happens, because here's the end result. <clears throat> the abused continue to get abused. They continue to be persecuted. They continue to suffer. And a lot of times when the abuse victim speak, speaks up and they don't get any help, the abuse gets way worse. And so the abuse victim, the, the, the real lamb, the one who's really been persecuted and, and abused and mistreated, they get marginalized and they learn that if I speak up and try to hold the abuser accountable who's naming the name of Christ, even if I do this in the church, all that's going to happen is I get even more alienated, I get even more marginalized, I get even more persecuted, and the abuser grows and is strengthened and more esteemed and gets a bigger stronghold in the church. That's what they learn. And then those who would be I mean, maybe on the outside of this, but who are just holding the abuse victim accountable, they get shunned and they get pushed down. They get bullied by, ironically, they get bullied by the grace and loving crowd. 
If you don't hold to the demonic applications of love and grace, now all of a sudden you're unloving and gracious. Well, how loving and gracious is that conclusion? It's, it's hypocritical. But that's what happens. I've seen, I've seen it happen before. And so, what's the net effect in a church? The abuser, the abuser and the manipulator, they get strengthened. They build their little network of enablers. They get a bigger stronghold, a bigger platform. They get even more enabled, more emboldened to continue their games and lies and abuse. And the abused victims get marginalized. They're going to get more abused. And they learn that the love of, they learn through the church that the love of Christ means minimizing, minimizing all this sin and just squashing the abused in the name of grace. And in fact, now the abused and those hold them accountable, they often get slandered as being divisive and unloving. And so that's what the abuse victim learned is that if I hold some, if I hold my abuser accountable, I'm divisive, I'm unloving, I'm ungracious, I'm unforgiving, I don't get the gospel, the abuser gets enabled, and all you guys gang up on me. That's what happens. And so more and more the people with discernment get marginalized and eventually are just gone. The abuse victims are silenced and maybe just gone, and the abuser and all the game players, they get strengthened. And then the church congratulates itself that it is so understanding of the love of God. Man, we get the love of God. We get the grace of God. We get the gospel. And they congratulate themselves. And Satan laughs as he starts to take the throne of this particular uh, of a particular church. That's what happens. Happens all the time. And it happens because we don't have discernment. And so when these things happen, the relabeling is successful. Good is called evil. Evil is called good. The evil demonic applications of the gospel that do nothing but enable and strengthen the unrepentant, manipulative, game-playing abusers, that's an evil application of the gospel. That gets called good and gracious and getting the gospel. And the good accountability that demands repentance from the professing believer, that good thing gets relabeled as evil. And in the church of Christ, an abomination is committed. The wicked are acquitted. The abuser and those who are blind and stubborn and hard and make all these demonic applications of grace, they get acquitted. They get strengthened. And the righteous the abused, or those who are standing up to the manipulators, they get condemned. Satan laughs, and it's it's tragic. It is tragic, tragic, tragic. Because when you, you, you get things in these, you know, I've heard people say, man, it's, you know, in, in, in some of these situations, man, you know what, hey, here's the details. Okay, here's the evidence. Well, you know what, it's possible to be so right in the details that you miss the heart of everything. Or, you know what? God never cares about the details of this dispute. Come on, abuse victim. God doesn't care about the details. He just cares that we have grace and get along. You know, I've heard leaders say this kind of stuff. And as long as the leadership is that unequipped, then the church is always going to follow. And these abominations are going to continue to be committed in the church of Jesus Christ. And there's going to be very little hope for the abuse victim. So bring this to a conclusion. If you are an abuse victim, especially, I hope that in seeing this, that I, here's one thing I hope happens for you. There's someone else. There is someone in the church. There are churches who recognize that this happens. And not only do we recognize that abusers get enabled in these ways that twist the scriptures, not only do we recognize it, but you know what? We don't, we don't operate that way. And there are churches, there are Christians who will see through the games, who have knowledge and discernment, and who will hold the abuser accountable unto faith and repentance. Hopefully the abuser gets saved. But listen, there are churches, you may have had an experience where you got shunned and, and persecuted for trying to hold someone accountable. That may, I, I have no, I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's happened to you. And so I just, like, I'm sorry that happened to you. And I want to encourage you, man, that is not what God desires. That's not pleasing to the Lord. And there are, though it may have happened to you in a church or multiple churches, there are churches where that doesn't happen. So I'd encourage you to find one. 
And if you're in a church where from the top down, this type of false grace and false love and false use of the gospel is widespread. Listen, I, I tremble to say this. I've almost never said this to anybody in my ministry, but I, I want to encourage you. I would leave that church. It's a sinking ship. It is going to go down. Satan will have so many wolves planted in that church. Acts 20, 2 Peter 2 says they will rise up from inside that church. The wolves will be enabled. They will grow and the faithful will be marginalized and persecuted. I would, I would leave a church over that. Um, and so, uh, and then lastly for the, the saint or the pastor or whatever, maybe you're, you know, you know, maybe you're not sure about this. Maybe you've been deceived and had false applications of grace and love in the gospel. If that's you, hey, welcome to the club. I've done that too. I want to just encourage you, man, keep growing in love and discernment. Keep growing and understanding the, the, the real mission. And so if you got to admit that you were wrong about some things, that's okay. Look, we as pastors, like we make mistakes, right guys? I, I know I have, and, and I'm sure you have too. But let's keep laboring and growing. Let's not leave our flocks unprotected. Psalm 82, four says, rescue the weak and needy and save them from the hand of the wicked. And we don't do any faithful service to the gospel by enabling manipulators, enabling game players, enabling the unrepentant brothers. We got to hold them accountable to repent of their sins. And if they're repenters, yeah, we forgive 70 times seven and love and bear with, but we got to turn from these demonic applications of the gospel. Any application that makes light of sin, any application that makes even if it's not unintentional, even if it's not intentionally spoken, but it's just implied, any application that makes obedience optional is a demonic application. We got to stop doing that, brothers. We got to labor for the for a holy church, for a holy bride through the gospel. We got to protect the most vulnerable sheep in our congregation. And we've got to deal with these bullies and these abusers and these wolves because God promised in Acts 20 and in 2 Peter 2, he's in multiple places. He's promised they will come. They're coming and we got to be ready to stand up to them. And when they come as a church, we need to stand united. Ephesians 4, we're not tossed and blown about by their deceitful schemes, but we are equipped, able to stand in the truth of the gospel and the true applications of the gospel, namely the holy love and obedience of his church. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to save sinners who will love him and love others and walk in holiness and walk in obedience. That's why he died. And we can't work against the master in the name of the master. We can't do that. We've got to turn from this. So anyways, Love you guys, uh, listening, uh, abuse victims, abuser. Lastly, hey, listen, you can be saved. You can. And here's how. Stop lying. Stop deceiving. Stop playing games. Stop manipulating. Stop trying to control everything. You need to weep and bring yourself to Jesus Christ. He died on the cross and it's sufficient to pay for your sins, but make no mistake about it. Some little magic act called praying and acting, asking Jesus into your heart will not save you. Here's what saves you. Faith and repentance. Acts 17. Paul said, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Believe he died for your sins. Believe he rose from the dead and turn from this wicked lifestyle of abuse. And whoever you need to make things right to, you go make it right to them. Surrender your control of any situation. Give it to God. Trust in him and let him save your soul because Jesus Christ has warned. It is better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than to be an abuser. You will suffer the judgment of eternal conscious torment in hell if you don't stop playing games and repent, especially if you continue your abuse and manipulation in the name of Jesus. There's an even worse place in hell for people who do that uh, than the atheistic abuser. So listen, abuser, you can be saved. You can be. The apostle Paul was a total abuser and he was saved, but it's through faith and repentance, not through gameplay. So surrender this and be saved. Again, I love you guys. Um, I know there's a lot to, uh, that I didn't say in this. You know, there's a lot of questions we could ask. I get all that. I, again, I'm just trying to give a general framework here to help us start to think through this and have a good foundation to have more nuanced conversations potentially down the road. So love you guys. Not trying to pick on anybody or, or beat anyone up, but we do have to speak the truth boldly and plainly so that we are not deceived by Satan's schemes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is a light unto our feet. We thank you for the truth that sets us free. God, I just pray for us 
who are listening. I pray for your church in this country. God, help us not be deceived and not be naive into thinking that your love and your grace and your gospel and forgiveness, that all of that is about enabling sin. Help us not to do it explicitly or even implicitly, God. Help us to love the obedience of faith that comes through the gospel and help us labor for a holy bride. Paul said he labors to present the church holy and spotless to Jesus Christ. God, may we all as pastors and leaders, may we all as church members labor for that. That's the real mission, God. Give us a passion for that, Lord and bind us together and unite us in those things in a holy, godly mission, Lord. I pray you will save abusers and they will repent of their sins. I pray you will minister to abuse victims and they'll know the real love of Christ, not the fake love that enables the 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 hardened game-playing manipulator, but the real love that calls out sin and calls for repentance and will protect someone who's being abused. God, please do these things and lead and guide your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.